notice and comment, and um, notice and comment. You can tell I'm an administrative lawyer. Notice and consent. Uh, but first, we have an announcement from IEPP. And also, I wanted to uh, let all of you know that you're invited, all of you, to a reception being held immediately at the close of the day's proceedings. So please, um, please come. It, it will be out there in the lodge. Oh. <laughs> oh, Excuse me, a quick announcement. Um, <laughs> I'm Kim McNeil from the International Association of Privacy Professionals. I know we have several members in the room that were wondering about um, certification credits, and we will be awarded seven credits for this. If you apply, you need to go online and fill in the application. And if you have any questions about membership or anything about the IAPP, you can find me later. Thanks. Hi, my name is Sarah Luddington. I'm the moderator for this panel. And the topic of the panel, as you know, is uh, consumer privacy through notice and consent. And just to set the stage very briefly, this topic concerns the difference between, or the different ways in which the US and the EU protect consumer data, transaction data, um, through privacy policies. Now we have five speakers today, and I'm going to ask them to limit themselves very strictly to 10 minutes, no more than 10 minutes, so that we can have a good long time afterwards for audience Q&A. I have corrected the time on the clock over there, so the clock <laughs> is now, should be fairly accurate. Um, our first speaker is going to be Katie Rette, who's an attorney with the Federal Trade Commission. She has worked on international data transfer policies. Following that will be Annie Anton, who is a professor of software engineering at NC State and the founder of The Privacy Place. She has extensively studied the, the effectiveness of privacy policies. After that, Fred Kate, a professor of law at Indiana University and the director of the Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research. Following Professor Kate, Giovanni Budarelli, who is the Secretary General of the Italian Data Protection Authority. And finally, Professor Peter Swire of the Moritz College of Law at Ohio State University, who was formerly President Clinton's Chief Counselor for Privacy in the Office of Management and Budget. Katie? All right. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be back here this morning. I'd like to thank the conference organizers for having me. Um, because I'm FTC staff, I have to start with a standard disclaimer, and that's that the views I'm presenting are my own, and not necessarily those of the Federal Trade Commission or any individual commissioner, and certainly not any former bureau chiefs who might have spoken before me earlier this morning. <laughs> um, I'm going to attempt to resuscitate the notice and consent model a little bit um, and talk about the continuing importance of notice and consent to FTC law and policy. Um, there are a lot of reasons that the FTC likes notice and consent. You know, one of our, our big mantras at the FTC is empowering consumers. We consider that to be one of our central missions as an agency. So we like the idea of giving consumers the ability to exercise choices and the tools to proactively protect themselves from misuse of their information. We also think that privacy notices have raised the public's general awareness about how their personal information is being used. We also think the privacy notices promote transparency, which in turn promote the functioning of free markets. Privacy notices promote accountability, and they also play an important role in our Section 5 enforcement work, which Howard Beals talked about earlier. That being said, the notice and choice model definitely has certain limitations. We know that notices are too long and too complex, and often consumers don't read them. But that being said, they're still a really important part of our enforcement program. Um, as Howard mentioned, we have a number of specialized statutes in the privacy area, such as Gramm-Leach-Bliley for financial institutions and the Fair Credit Reporting Act. But our main statutory authority over companies' privacy and data security practices is Section 5 of the FTC Act, which prohibits unfair or deceptive acts or practices in or affecting commerce. Under our deception authority, we can take action against misrepresentations. The representation or omission must be material, and likely to mislead a consumer acting reasonably under the circumstances. And we have found that representations in privacy statements are material. So for example, we've taken action against companies that made certain claims about their privacy practices, such as we don't share your information with third parties, and then failed to live up to those promises. 
We've also taken action against companies that fail to live up to the claims that they make about data security. And usually those claims are along the lines of, we provide reasonable protections for your data. Of course, we can still take action against companies even in the absence of a representation. And that's where our unfairness authority comes in. Unfair practices are defined as those that cause or are likely to cause substantial injury to consumers, which is not reasonably outweighed by countervailing benefits to consumers or competition. And the key there is really the injury requirement. And it has to be injury of a type that cannot be reasonably avoided by consumers. So this means that even in the absence of a misrepresentation, the FTC can step in if a business's practices are so deficient that they cause harm to consumers. And we've brought a number of cases alleging that a company's data security was so awful that it constituted an unfair practice under Section 5. And Howard talked about a few of these, but I'll just mention them again. You know, BJs, that was wireless vulnerabilities. We had Choice Point where you know, we tried to send the message, do not sell credit reports to a Nigerian fraud ring. DSW, we really looked at data retention issues. And Card Systems was similar, um, but with respect to a service provider. So we really look at this body of cases as a way of creating a set of minimum standards for reasonable data security. And we at the FTC, we always talk about the fact that we're not prescriptive, we're not setting out specific standards, but we're really trying to send a message about a floor for data security. And that's what we think these cases have done. The notice and choice model has also been a key feature of industry self-regulatory efforts, which are an important complement to the FTC's enforcement role. Our most recent example came out of our behavioral advertising workshop in November. And just to give a very general definition of what I'm talking about, behavioral advertising refers to the practice of tracking consumers' activities online as they're going through internet sites for the purpose of targeting advertising specifically to them. And one of the issues that came up at the workshop is that the information being collected about consumers as they travel around the internet is largely invisible to them. Consumers really have no idea that this is going on. So in response to the, this and other concerns, the FTC issued principles that are anchored in the notice concept. And these, are, these are not regulations. These are intended to encourage more effective industry self-regulation. And they're based on existing concepts in FTC law and policy, such as notice and choice. And here we're really trying to send the message that you know, disclosures are still an important antidote to this problem of invisibility. And the intention here is that notices in this space will be very clear, very readable, very consumer friendly. And we're really looking for the most concise and meaningful disclosures possible. And we realize that you know, we, have, we have a lot of room for improvement here. And so we're calling upon industry to respond to our, our regulations and show us what they can do in this area. And this is also an area where I think we need more general consumer education to inform people about what's going on. And with that, I'll wrap up and turn it over to the next panelist. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I should tell you that I'm not a lawyer. Um, I don't play one on TV. So I am a professor of software engineering. And in our research group, what we have been trying to focus on is extracting software requirements from privacy policies and privacy laws to ensure that we can build regulatory uh, uh, systems that are compliant with law uh, and regulations. And so that's really been our general focus. And through that work, we've really learned a lot about privacy policies and have, uh, do, have analyzed over 100 documents. And so I was going to tell you a little bit about three different studies that we've done. And I should note that um, I've done a lot of this work with Dr. Julie Earp, who's um, sitting up there in the middle of the, of the room, and with my students at the Privacy Place, many of whom are here. So when we talk about transparency, I think when we're talking about notice of consent, transparency is very important. And so. Um, transparency requires privacy notices, according to Hutton, that are easy to understand, facilitate comparison, and are actionable. I'd like to leave that as a definition for us to think about as we're looking at um, different aspects of privacy and notices. So um, in 2002, we developed a survey instrument, and we collected data from over 1,000 um, Internet users. And what we were interested in doing is comparing what people were interested in seeing in privacy notices with what was actually in the content of a privacy notice. And we saw that there was a very big misalignment. And we were looking here at, um, we analyzed privacy notices from retail, healthcare, and financial industries. And what we found is that consumers are most interested in seeing information in a policy 
that states things about information transfer, notice and awareness, and information storage. And yet the three things that were most emphasized in privacy documents were data integrity and security, information collection, and user choice and consent. And so clearly we need to better understand what people expect to see in these policies and want to see in these policies. And so um, I think that provides some interesting guidance for those of you who are responsible for writing policies. More recently we did an experiment where we were looking at the difference between user perception of privacy policies and user co comprehension of privacy policies. Um, so this was work that uh, Matt Vale did, who's one of my master's thesis students, and again, he was working with Dr. Earp and I. So we looked at three um, privacy policies from three healthcare um, institutions, drugstore.com, healthcare, healthcentral.com, and novartis.com. And one of, um, one of these had more vulnerabilities expressed in the privacy policy. Another one had more protections, privacy protections expressed in the privacy policy. And then our control group was one that had an equal number of both. And um, we blanked out the names so people didn't know which privacy policy they were seeing. And we provided four different representations of privacy policies to see how people responded to each. So one representation was the original natural language policy from each company. Um, the other one was a list of privacy goals and vulnerabilities that had been extracted from those privacy policy documents. The third one was a categorical representation of the kinds of information that are provided in those policies. And this was based on a taxonomy that we developed um, several years ago for privacy policies and, and requirements. And then the fourth was the original natural language policy, but as you hovered your mouse over the text, it would pop up a corresponding goal for each statement. And the findings were actually quite, quite interesting. So users perceive the websites that express the privacy policies with those highlights to be more secure. Um, in addition, they also perceive those that provided the goals and vulnerability highlights as more protective. And one of the things that was interesting is that users were able to distinguish between the most vulnerable sites and the more, more, most protective ones. So that's good, too, because um, we want people to be able to make informed decisions. Um, but interestingly enough, the, the, the representation that they felt was least explained was the categorical variant. So this was just the taxonomy. Um, so if you clicked on the taxonomy um, category, so for instance, notice and consent, then it would show you the practices that had to do with um, notice and consent for that particular, uh, or notice and awareness, excuse me, for that particular policy. And the ones that they felt uh, were most um, thoroughly explained were the original policy, natural language policy, and the ones with the highlights for the goals. So what's interesting here is that um, users perceived that length of the document reflected thoroughness of explanation of the practices. So keep, keep that in mind. Remember, categorical was least explained, and they didn't like it very much. So then we did a comprehension test. And we provided um, a multiple choice set of questions for each specific um, policy document. And so we asked which statement is true regarding Brand X's information practices, and they had to say answer correctly. And what we found is that um, user perception and comprehension were very misaligned because the perception was that the categorical was the least explained and not very informative, and yet that's the one that yielded the best comprehension scores. And it's not that surprising given that people generally handle abstractions a lot better. Um, and then the goals with the vulnerabilities um, led to the next highest score. So I should say that the comprehension score on average was 65.67. So that's still really sad, right? Because I, I, I didn't see state that's a failing grade. And so clearly <laughs> we are failing in our ability to provide comprehensible um, policies to our end users. And we also asked um, which, if they had read the entire policy. And 62% of the people who, were, who received the categories um, representation um, said they read the entire policy. And we had already thrown out people who had clearly finished too quickly and, and couldn't have uh, done it. Um, and 56% said they read the policy, so the regular policy. So in, in summary for this study, what we found is that users comprehend natural language policies the least of the four representations. Simply adding goals to the natural language policy increased comprehension. Um, and there was a significant increase in comprehension when the goals were categorized 
um, according to the protections and vulnerabilities. <laughs> but overall, the scores are still alarmingly low, um, despite which variant we used. And so, in conclusion, um, I should say that users believed that the, they are more secure sharing personally identifiable information with websites that display a natural language policy that highlights the goals with the vulnerabilities. Um, and the companies that display natural pol language policies that also highlight the goals and vulnerabilities, they perceive they, they will have their information protected the most. And the two natural language variants were perceived to be explained more thoroughly than alternative expressions. So um, user per perception and comprehension is misaligned. And they like natural language policies, but they comprehend them the worst. And so I think it really behooves us to find better ways of drafting and, and representing these policies in ways that people can understand them. And then um, another study looking at choice and consent, and since um, we're talking about international audiences, we've also, this is work I've done with Paul Otto, who's a PhD student at NC State in computer science and a first-year law student here at Duke at the same time, and uh, talk about overachiever. Um, so what if you have a question about an organization's privacy policy? Well, Paul and I actually called a lot of the, and, and sent emails and filled out web forms for the American Airlines um, last year, or a year, it was in May of 2006. And so we contacted each of the airlines because we were interested in identifying the kinds of information they collect, with whom do they share information, and we wanted to model data flows from a systems engineering perspective. <coughs> so we had a little script, you know, hello, my name is Annie Anton, I've read your privacy policy, and have a few questions about it. And so we asked three specific questions to that specific airline's privacy notice, and then we asked some additional um, questions of all of them, like do you share information with DHS or the TSA? Um, and we asked who are your third parties, what do you get in exchange for sharing information, et cetera. And, and it was a really <coughs> insightful um, exercise. So we called, when we sent email to Continental Airlines, this is uh, interesting, we sent email to Continental and seven, it, it took seven days before we got an answer. <coughs> and the answer that we finally got was, please review our privacy policy. <laughs> so then we called Jet, we, we sent email to JetBlue and JetBlue took nine days. So we were taking a little longer. But then we got this lovely email from customer commitment crew member Nancy. And Nancy said, please review the privacy policy. If you have questions, please email or call. We're happy to respond, but it would be more efficient if you first read the privacy policy. Now, clearly, the first thing our, pri our note email said was, we have read your privacy policy and have the following questions, but hey. So um, really quickly, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good was Alaska Airlines, interestingly enough. And they had, we got a call back from Alaska Airlines within about 10 minutes, I think. And we spoke with the person who wrote the privacy policy. And it turned out that he was a contractor. So he works for Alaska Airlines a few hours a week, and then he's on call to handle questions like the ones that we had. And we thought, gosh, isn't that a very interesting model? And maybe that's the right way. Maybe you don't need someone there full time. You need someone who's accessible and available and who knows how to answer questions. And so he really answered our questions fully to our satisfaction. And we thought, oh gosh, maybe we found the right, you know, one industry in the United States that's doing it right, that finally got it right. Well, we were wrong. We called Continental, they were the bad. And uh, we were put on hold and they didn't have information and they said there was no place to go for an answer. They were not aware of a compliance officer. Now, mind you, they provide a phone number for you to call if you have questions about the privacy policy. But no one there could answer questions. So. Notice, consent, um, transparency, these are issues that are concerning. Um, and then finally, we called um, the ugly. <laughs> and I, with my apologies to Jane Horvath and Peter Swire, who flew in on United yesterday, um, this was a very painful, <laughs> painful uh, about hour that we were on the phone. We got transferred to many different places, told to call many different numbers, and we ended up with someone in India. Um, and uh, she, we asked to speak with her supervisor because clearly she d couldn't answer our questions. And she was getting a little agitated. And um, so she, she finally, she said, well, I'll talk with my supervisor. And she came back and she said, we don't share information with government agencies because you have a social security number. <laughs> so when we asked for a corporate office telephone number or a legal department, um, she got very agitated and actually yelled at us. So. 
that was just amazing. I thought, goodness, I won't be flying United anytime soon. So um, more recently, we've looked at European airlines. And we haven't uh, fully analyzed the data, but I wanted to give you a little glimpse at what we've looked at. What we found with the European airlines is that they tend to be more descriptive than the American airlines privacy notices. Um, there's more detail on what information is being collected. They provide justifications for the data collection, and they list the uses of the data. On, um, on the other hand, though, they tended to be less readable than, um, than American policy. So we use the flush Kincaid um, reading uh, scores for this. And so the European um, airlines had an um, average, re require two years of college education in order to be able to read them. The, U the US airlines require two years of high school, so they're more accessible to the general public here in the United States. But, in, but the ones in Europe tend to be shorter than the ones in the United States. On average, they were less responsive to email in Europe than here. Um, but then many U.S. airlines also have automated responses that say, please read our privacy policy. Um, the European ones generally uh, pointed to uh, passenger name rate group requirements as forcing airlines to collect information. Um, and they're generally not selling data to third parties, but it's not clear which third parties are receiving information. Um, and it's gener generally less difficult reaching a knowledgeable person on the phone in Europe um, and they generally tend to be very apologetic about data collection requirements. So in, in closing, some recommendations. I think it's really important to construct meaningful and reading, readable privacy policies and privacy notices for our websites. It's important to consider alternative representations given what we've learned about comprehension versus <coughs> perception. And it's really important to test your policies with a focus group. Don't just write it and think that everyone's going to understand it or that it really covers the things that people are very interested in. Um, and ensure that the people who may be contacted about your privacy policy are trained to respond in a meaningful way. So thank you very much. Well, now we have conclusive academic evidence that airlines provide bad customer service. Um, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm daunted. I look up and I see Richard Purcell there, more, moreover, in a suit, which is a, an enormous <laughs> surprise. And, and Peter used things. I see an audience full of people who have forgotten more about privacy than I will probably ever know. But um, in the interest of the uh, brevity of time available to us, uh, let's uh, get started. Uh, um, I don't think there's any evidence anywhere that notice has ever worked not only in data protection, but in the vast majority of other settings. Right? How many of you have read an informed consent notice at a, at a hospital before surgery? Right? How many of you have read a, a homeowner's notice, right, the, the required disclosure? Right. right, other than the people who get paid to work with notices? <laughs> you know, I, I'm sort of with Howard on this. I ask all my classes this. I, uh, these are students you know, who choose to take a notice class and find if, if at most one or maybe two people has ever read one. When my wife and I applied for our first mortgage, she's a lawyer, and she started to read the 27 pages of legal size disclosure that they provided. And I said, you know, if, if you're going to read that, we're going to be here all day, and you can't change any terms anyway. And she looked at the banker, and the banker said, well, you know, that's right. Your choice is to leave if you don't like that notice. And so she wisely put the notice down without finishing it, and that's what consumers do as well. And what's interesting is we have lots of survey data that tells us how interested consumers are in this issue. And I read an article on the way down on the uh, plane by someone who I normally uh, disagree with almost everything he writes. We spend a lot of time debating each other. James Neff is a, is a consumer and um, uh, antitrust lawyer. And he's written an article for the um, uh, Journal of Consumer Affairs in which he surveys all of these surveys about how much people care about their privacy and that they say they make decisions based on their privacy and that they choose where to shop and they, some of them stay off the internet. The FTC's quoted that survey quite a bit about the percentage of consumers who stay off. And then, then he writes this, and he's a huge privacy uh, advocate. He writes, unfortunately, what uh, occurs in a research environment does not happen in the online world. While consumers in these controlled environments seem to value privacy and strive to protect it in their decisions about sharing information, their decisions about disclosing information in online transactions do not match their stated privacy concerns. 
And then he cites 50 studies showing that this, that they say one thing and they do another. Consumers seldom read privacy policies. They seldom, if ever, cite privacy as a factor in deciding which business to use or which websites to frequent. And then he goes on to point out, in addition to all the reasons we know about, uh, that we're in a rush, we don't have meaningful choices, we don't understand them, they're not comparable, and so forth, that much of the reason is because we don't want to be faced with the choice if we had one. And again, he writes in this wonderful vocabulary, which um, I don't always understand, but he says, exerting more cognitive effort can result in the negative effect associated with the alternative and can make the alternative namely having a choice, less appealing simply because we don't know how to make the choice. We don't want to make these choices. Right? When you want a service, the last thing you want to do is have to stop and think about privacy, to evaluate privacy. Yet despite this widely acknowledged reality, we have built Notice and Choice as the foundation, certainly in the US and to a lesser extent in Europe, of broad-based data protection laws. And you can look at any of the recent enactments, and again, I, I'm going to focus here on the, on the U.S. because I feel more comfortable in that environment. Graham Leach Bliley Financial Services Modernization Act provides only three substantive restrictions on the use of personal information. Right? Prohibitions on sharing account numbers for marketing, <coughs> prohibitions on pretext calling, and uh, prohibitions on transferring personal information to third parties for marketing if the data subject has opted out. That's it. That whole provision only has three substantive limits on what financial institutions can do with, do with data. Well, instead, where the focus is, and certainly where the money is spent, is on requiring that every financial institution in the country mail out a notice to every one of its customers, at least annually, even if nothing has changed since the last notice you mailed out. And what we know is that those notices are nearly universally ignored. In fact, in 2001, FTC Chairman uh, Timothy Murish wrote, the recent experience with Graham Leach Bliley privacy notices should give everyone pause about whether we know enough to implement effectively broad-based legislation based on notices. Acres of trees died to provide a blizzard of barely comprehensible privacy notices. Indeed, it is a statute only lawyers could love until they found out it applied to them <laughs> when we sued to be exempted from it. Or look at HIPAA, probably the most recent example of broad-based federal legislation, which provides three notice and choice opportunities, right? So that after, uh, after being amended, you have uh, uh, consent and payment use, which requires disclosure. You get that, of course, when you go see your a doctor, you go to a hospital, and an effort to get a written acknowledgment back and then there is opt-in authorization, which requires another separate notice and a written authorization document. And then there are other types of opt-out uh, opportunities, for example, for directory information. And this requires uh, the agreement of the individual manifested by not opting out. This may really mark the apex of US choice-based privacy law. Right? We have one rule to deal with one type of information that provides for three different types of notice and choice opportunities. Now, the problem with notice and choice isn't simply, though, that it doesn't work. It's that it's intellectually dishonest, right? Because we know that it doesn't work. So when 39 state legislatures say the best way to deal with security breaches in this country is not try to prevent breaches, but rather mail notices to people who have very little power to do anything in response to those notices, it's a cheap way out. It doesn't cost the government anything. It's a politically easy way out. It doesn't require coming to agreement on a serious problem that requires a serious solution. And it is an ineffective way out. Right? It is intellectually dishonest in that sense. It's intellectually dishonest in another sense as well. Often notice does not present any meaningful choice. Right? When was the last time you downloaded software that gave you an IP policy or a data protection policy and gave you any choice as to what you did with it? Right? It says, I accept or I decline. Or more commonly now, if you don't click the I accept button, you can't even hit the button that says install the software. So you have only one choice. Right? Lawyers feel great about this. We call this informed consent and choice. The rest of the world knows it's a lie. It's not notice and choice. It absolutely does not provide that opportunity. Moreover, we have exempted most of the most uh, privacy invading uses of information from this notice and choice regime that we've spent so much time focusing on. 
So it doesn't really matter where you look. Look, for example, the HIPAA. Non-consensual disclosures of health information are permitted for public health activities to report victims of abuse, neglect, domestic violence, judicial administrative proceedings with a court order by subpoena, discovery request, to enable product recalls, repairs, or replacement to facilitate organ and tissue transplantation. So far, you may be with me. So far, you may be saying, look, these are all useful uses. These should all be outside of the notice regime. But it goes on to permit non-consensual use for law enforcement activities with a warrant, subpoena, administrative request, investigative demand, or even a law enforcement official's request. Right. Well, given that the core privacy issue that, at least in the US, we most worry about is government access to data, exempting all of those uses from a notice and choice regime, but still saying we have notice and choice privacy protection, seems remarkably dishonest. I wonder, frankly, if the situation is much different in Europe, where we also see aggressive surveillance program, video surveillance used widely, especially in the United Kingdom. In fact, I think the highest proliferation anywhere in the world of video cameras is thought to be uh, in London. Um, notice and choice doesn't cover those. If you choose to be there, you're on notice. You're going to be uh, filmed. or. Um, for example, the announcement just uh, two weeks ago that the United Kingdom intends to implant RFID chips in its prisoners as a way of reducing prison overcrowding by releasing them early and then using monitoring systems to follow them uh, with these RFID chips. This is the high level of privacy protection. If it, if it doesn't apply here, if it's not working here, why do we worry so much in the commercial setting? Are we focused on the wrong question? It's not that privacy in the commercial setting doesn't matter. It's that this is where we have invested the millions or billions of dollars we have spent on notice and choice, on privacy notices that nobody reads or, or understands, on um, uh, the, the public attention. Uh, you know, when you uh, gave the list of things that uh, website notices often cover that people don't pay attention to and don't care about, it reminded me that's the FTC's list, right? That's what you have to cover. The, the law has focused on that. So we have directed people to notices that don't apparently even cover the information that if they are forced to read them, that they might uh, most be concerned about. And then when we get there, we don't provide them with meaningful choices to make or choices about the things that might have greatest impact on them. Uh, finally, um, let me say, th there are many times in which, of course, there are benefits of having no choice. And so a system that is built on notice and choice has to acknowledge that and then deal with those situations in which we're going to now consider, I guess, exceptions to this. Credit reporting is an exception we often use. Uh, how Reveals mentioned this morning, you know, individuals probably would not choose to have negative financial information about them ab correctly aggregated to their financial report. They would rather go in somebody else's uh, credit report. Uh, and so we don't give them choice about that. Uh, we don't make that a choice area. All of the examples uh, I gave from HIPAA uh, probably are areas in which uh, many of them anyway, we would agree. You don't really want a choice if you're looking for a missing person, if you're trying to put together a uh, facilitate organ and tissue transplantation where the life of the organ or tissue involved is, is measured in hours. And that's not really a place you want to interpose a, a, a choice-based system. And yet, by having focus on that so extensively in the US, we're left with a the absence of a really meaningful model to use other than just exemptions to notice and choice. So I guess I would like to suggest four points we might focus uh, that would be better. Uh, one, transparency instead of notice. And again, Howard mentioned this this morning. I said to him after he spoke, I felt like I could just sit down because I think he made very well this critical point, which is notice as it originated in the US environment was not about waylaying individuals on their way to do something. It was about providing transparency so that public interest groups, so that people who were interested, so that academic researchers, so that other industries could know what was going on. And transparency, particularly in the area of security breach notices or many types of privacy notices, would be extremely useful, far more useful than this fiction we have built around individual notices. Uh, second of all, I think we need to focus more on substantive instead of purely procedural restrictions. Um, there are simply some things done with information that shouldn't be done. 
Um, and I think, again, Howard touched on those, and, and we've already heard again from the FTC, uh, you know, transferring credit card data wirelessly without uh, encryption or other uh, protection seems like something that you really shouldn't need to call it either unfair or deceptive. It's just wrong. The law should say you cannot do that. Right? We should be able to build some basic assumptions about the correct use of data and assumptions that would track. The research shows what people most care about, what, the, what they worry about. Um, third, I think um, we have gone down the wrong road and the term data protection exactly highlights what worries me. I'm not the least bit interested in protecting data. And I don't think most people are the least bit interested in protecting data. What they care about is themselves. They care about their privacy, they care about their security, they care about their safety. They're worried about the misuse of data. They're worried about data used in ways that harms them, that injures them. And I think focusing on data protection, like locking down data is a good in itself, both ignores the reality of the modern economy, it, it ignores the reality of the world in which we live, and it's frankly not what most people are interested in. And that even while we might be able to debate that, while debating that, maybe we could at least focus on some substantive areas where uh, law might evolve to provide better protection. And finally, um, I think, and this is very uh, focused on the United States, uh, I, I think we have to be extremely careful by this uh, sort of wall that we have built in the regulatory world between public and private sector. Because that wall doesn't exist in the data world, the data just moves freely between the two. And therefore, while we have focused a lot on notices that nobody reads or understands, we actually, you know, I would argue, I think anyone in this room would argue, have seen declining privacy over the past five years. I don't think anyone would argue your privacy is better protected now than it was before this raft of new laws were enacted. And so we need to be thinking not just about substantive uh, it, uh, protections in the commercial environment, but about in the uh, government environment uh, as well. Government access to individual data, government access to private sector data about individuals, the compulsory disclosure of data where there's no apparent use for it, the infinite retention of data uh, without limits. Um, I think these are the types of issues that as we focus on substantive guidelines, uh, we as a society and, and we as the members of this conference would be well advised to focus on um, more broadly than just in a commercial sector. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. My duty today is to escort you in a high-speed trip in Europe, uh, no more than 10 minutes under the strict control of Captain Laditon. <laughs> you can take uh, videos, uh, pictures, uh, postcards, free of charge for you, <laughs> <laughs> insurance is included, but at just one condition, at the end of uh, this trip uh, you must uh, give yourself uh, an answer to uh, a couple of questions. Let me tell you that the data, uh, we start the trip, let me tell you that the data subjects consent uh, has uh, never been a myth in uh, Europe, uh, nor has uh, it ever been uh, the only precondition uh, for lawfully uh, processing personal data. In fact, the European legal experience concerning consent is more flexible than it might seem uh, at first sight. It is unquestionable that several European countries have found it necessary to write down a list of preconditions for processing personal data. That is to say, they have set out the rule that to lawfully uh, process personal data, you must have a legal basis, and such legal basis consists in fulfilling any of the conditions under which uh, using the data is lawful. This can be traced back to our legal uh, tradition uh, and the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, in particular Article 8, whereby, uh, apart from the consent, uh, lawfulness uh, of the processing of personal data must be necessarily provided for by law. However, it, it is also grounded on the 1995 uh, directive, in particular Article 7, according to which uh, 
you may only process personal data if you fall under one of the six cases mentioned in that article. Still, this does not mean that consent is, again, the only or the key component to be taken into account. Indeed, the current third or fourth generation data protection laws include a wide-ranging list of cases, especially with regard to the public sector, so much so that consent becomes ultimately the exception rather than the rule. The Charter of Fundamental Rights which has gained increased importance <coughs> following adoption of the Lisbon Treaty, also regards consent as one uh, of the preconditions to lawfully process personal data. There is little doubt that nowadays consent is playing a different role in Europe compared to 20 years ago. On the one hand, we required consent to be free, explicit, specific, and informed in order for it to be valid consent. Generally speaking, um, you are in front of a sufficient precondition if you use uh, an ambiguous consent, not necessarily given in written form, but to be documented at least by the controller. In some cases, a specific type of consent is required, a written consent. For instance, in order to process sensitive data, why do we put uh, so much emphasis on this feature of a person's consent? It is because we have observed that in the, in the information society there is really little room for one size fits all consent. As citizens, users or subscribers, it is in our best interest to consent to the use of our data in a flexible manner by considering who, where, and how our data is to be processed and for what purposes uh, this is to be done. Whenever consent continues to be the only or main uh, precondition to process personal data, sometimes depending on the very specific nature uh, of the used means of communications, for instance, email, uh, SMS, there is a trend towards focusing on the actual freedom dimension of consent on regarding data subjects as the real masters of their own data. However, the scope of consent is being eroded uh, and the empowerment of data subjects is turning more and more from a static type of consent given a priori or beforehand to the dynamic power of knowing and not knowing, following and rectifying the path followed by one's data adjusting the processing to meet specific requirements vested in a data subject, for instance, objecting to the processing on legitimate grounds, so as to secure the processing to the greatest possible extent. I'm not so sure whether this can be termed erosion of a consent, but I would like in any case to draw your attention to another issue, namely that in some cases we consider consent not to be enough. In some cases, the lawmakers have not trusted consent. They have considered it was not adequate in itself to protect data subjects. Or else, they have tried to foster a unified approach to the whole set of processing operations by preventing uh, differences related to the scope of the consent given by a data subjects and or the decisions make it, uh, made by the data controller. This has resulted into providing that certain processing operations, in some cases regardless of the data subject consent, should also be compliant with the instructions issued by a supervisory authority. Such instructions may come in the form of an ad hoc or general authorizations or else be based on the outcome of a prior checking procedure. This means that the interests at the issue in those cases are not regulated exclusively by consent. I mentioned that other preconditions may make it lawful to process personal uh, data. There is actually a wide gamut of uh, circumstances to be considered. For instance, we can avail ourselves of the balancing of interests, Article 7 of the Directive, what means in practice. Either the law or a supervisory authority, or in some cases the data controller, can enable processing operations by checking in concrete that the data controller's legitimate requirements may be pursued and are not overridden in concrete by the data subject's rights, freedoms, and legitimate requirements. Other cases are related to 
a public interest to be safeguarded, to a legal obligation to be fulfilled, to data which are publicly available in the true sense of the word, to data concerning the performance of business activity to some uh, vital interests. In my country, we attach so much importance to the appropriate use of consent that the Italian authority has laid down the principle whereby it is unfair to request consent whenever consent is useless because there is a contractual or pre-contractual relationship in place. Uh, this also means uh, to prevent data controllers from requesting this useless consent one and once and for all and without exceptions in order to carry out processing operations that might not be closely related to the contractual framework. A typical example would be the, the performance of marketing activities by the data controller and by a third party. Another interesting experience uh, I would like to, to report here very briefly has to do uh, with the clever use of contractual clauses whereby promotional activities, for instance, uh, an SMS message for advertising purposes, are referred to as unavoidable contractual obligations undertaken uh, by the data controller for the data subject's benefit, whilst they should be uh, the subject of a separate free consent. In several countries, uh, including Italy, the use of code of practice is also being tested. These codes have different legal values uh, depending on the specific circumstances and legal traditions. However, they are all meant to enhance the joint regulation of processing operations, and indeed, they can be regarded as examples of co-regulation rather than simply uh, of self-regulation. And using the flexible approach I've been describing, we are also try, uh, trying to draw the line between uh, not-for-profit researchers and uh, uh, marketing-related researchers. We have been trying to highlight uh, the peculiarities of commercial marketing as opposed to political marketing. To conclude, our system is not truly an opt-in system. However, we strive to implement the real opt-in conditions whenever such conditions are a must and we are in front of a real self-determination. I could quote many examples in this connection. As for loyalty programs, uh, profiling activities by hotels, TV broadcasting companies, department stores, and so on. My telephone is telling me <laughs> that the trip is finished. <laughs> so that there is, uh, time is running out. Please be silent. <laughs> we have just a, a couple of seconds. Is that notice or consent? <laughs> to put you the, the, the three questions. The first one is how long uh, can we accept that the safeguards afforded to citizens in the individual countries are so different, at least in some cases, given that data flows are increasingly global in today's world? The second one, are our legal systems really that different as regards uh, informed consent? And if they are, should we accept that data are used in our countries on the basis of a consent given elsewhere? The last one, if what matters is that uh, a data subject has fully understood and is fully in agreement with the request for his or her data, should not everything be managed in a more international uh, perspective? Captain uh, Ladington, I'm time, but I will ask you the courtesy to make a, a three-second break for an unexpected show, <laughs> <coughs> because all the Italian uh, uh, staff uh, from my office uh, worked hardly today to organize a, a data protection day uh, in many uh, Italian schools. They are at the screen now for uh, listening to this uh, conference and I would like to ask you Francesca Bignami in the interest of the organizer to give her consent and bring uh, this uh, t-shirt which was printed just for this uh, Data Protection Day. So, Francesca, <laughs> hands off your data. Giù le mani in Italian. Okay. Um, well, uh, 
I, I, following uh, Giovanni Buttarelli, that was a very optimistic and upbeat uh, description of, of, I think, yeah, some accomplishments in Europe. But I think the tone of the panel up, in up until then, maybe especially the two previous speakers, was thoroughly depressing, right? <laughs> <laughs> so let me just summarize a little bit. Annie Anton told us that the privacy policies the customers thought they liked, they didn't understand at all. And that was sort of how notice works, right? The ones you like, you actually have no clue what it says. And uh, that was the study. And Fred uh, showed us the choice is really a mess, and pretty much everything that uh, I ever worked on, among other things, uh, <laughs> HIPAA and Graham Leach Bliley, for instance, uh, is basically such a failure that we need a totally new paradigm and presumably new people to do it. So, um, so and, and also, I think, despite the upbeat moment on, on the European Union in this panel, in the previous panel, there were storm clouds gathering. After 9-11, there were very big challenges. There's been data retention directive that many of the data protection authorities have not been happy with. We see uh, data mining growing. We see international transfers as a constant uh, threat to the European regime. And so uh, with just a little bit of uh, perspective, we can be depressed about notice and choice in the US and Europe all within the first two minutes of my talk. Um, so that, I think, that's, that's the sort of trough of, dis, you know, a pit of despond or something like this, the, the, the bottom. I'm going to try to actually be a little more optimistic for the rest of my time um, and suggest some ways forward on, on notice and choice. And in particular, some of these grow out of work I'm doing with a group of uh, organizations, big international companies mostly, um, and uh, called the Consumer Privacy Legislation Forum. The views here are entirely my own and should never be attributed to any person in any of those companies. But I think some of the research um, and some of the thoughts uh, can be useful. Um, here's, a, here's a hard puzzle for data protection, which you can think of as a choice puzzle or you can think of it as something else. It's what's called secondary use. So people who've been around privacy for a while know that in the OECD guidelines, the 1980 guidelines that all the countries, including the US, were part of, um, that um, there was this principle that you should not use uh, data in ways that are, you can only use data in ways that are, quote, not incompatible with the original purpose. And then sometimes I go ask engineers, can you code for me what not incompatible with the original <laughs> purpose looks like? And the engineers look at me, they just, these lawyers, they must be a joke, right? I mean, they can't even imagine what it would mean to write software code that matches that. And if you can't build the software code, how can you build the business practices? And what would it mean, for instance, in the United States, if we ever passed a privacy law, how would we decide, this is okay, this is primary use, and then there's something else, we'll call it secondary use, and something else is required, like choice, like opt-out, or extra consent. And we already know how great consent and, and, uh, and notice and choice are. They're not so great. So we know then that there's this problem that we get data for one reason, and lots of companies, governments, all sorts of data controllers want to use it for other purposes, but how far do you go? And how can you imagine a regime you could actually build that, for instance, governments and companies could comply with, that, for instance, would protect individuals' privacy, and that you could do at some cost that actually made sense and in ways that made good decisions? And so the puzzle is how do you do secondary use when there's such vague language? The European 95 directive uses not incompatible language in it. Uh, and it. And it has other important language you've heard today about in Articles uh, 6 and 7 of the directive about legitimate processing and legitimate interests. But, it, but these are terms that in Europe are situated where you can go to your data protection authority and get guidance, where there may be the codes that we just heard described that have been worked out in your industry. But in a continent of the United States, 5,000 kilometers from Los Angeles to New York, the distance from London to Moscow, how do you get informal guidance in a way that companies and real people can, can build to? This is a big problem, big challenge. Um, so I'm going to, um, uh, as big a challenge as it is, suggest um, a sketch, um, some possible ways forward that maybe can do some good privacy things and can be things that match what good practices are. Um, and it's part of um, uh, this optimistic point that in our information age, we've actually built a lot of information privacy practices over the last decade. The International Association of Privacy Professionals began in 2001. Uh, I heard somebody on the board say they might have 2,000 people in their Washington conference in March. Right? That's an institutionalization. We do our IS journal on privacy year in review. It goes out to 5,000 privacy professionals in the United States, which I don't know if that sounds like a lot or a little, but it's sure a lot more than we're in the room 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so there's an institutionalization, a sort of actually caring. And the notices, among other things, are what all these privacy professionals actually feel they have to do for their companies, because otherwise Katie will bring an FTC enforcement action. Mm -hmm. 
And, and so there's a sort of reality to this that's a little more optimistic for good data practices than, than we often hear. So, so in the brief uh, uh, sort of three-minute version of the sketch, the big fights in the United States around uses going to third parties tends to be opt-out versus opt-in. And the problem is that doesn't fit the variety of human existence. So um, what, what, I, what I'd like to suggest is that there may be five or so categories, some larger number of categories, where we'd actually end up with substantive rules, as Fred has suggested may be necessary, that are somewhat different. So just briefly, one of them might be what you'd call fulfillment, to fulfill the transaction, to fulfill the warranty. And we expect when you buy something that you're going to have the data so that they can ship it to your house or whatever. A second is operations. Inside your organization, you're going to want to be able to do the things that it takes to make the company run. You have your auditors, you have your lawyers, you have your uh, statistical analysis to figure out new business. And then you hire third parties who work for you who have to be promised to be very good with the data. Those are the processors. So operations make sense. A third one, and this was alluded to a couple times today by Howard Beals, but also perhaps by the Europeans who are a little nervous here, might be called anti-fraud. <laughs> Because anti-fraud can mean we need to know everything about you and share it with everybody because maybe you're a bad guy. And if that's the law enforcement anti-fraud, we get everything, or it's the commercial anti-fraud, we need to know everything, then all of the other rules can get thrown out. Well, so here's an idea for anti-fraud. Maybe for anti-fraud, what you say is that data can go to people. So for instance, if this is the collected database, it can go to this database for anti-fraud purposes, but by law, it can't be used for any other purpose. Then it goes for anti-fraud purposes, sort of the way it went into the credit reporting agencies for those purposes. And there's strict rules by law, not notice, not choice, that says it doesn't come out for the marketing purposes of whoever happened to get the data, for instance. A fourth basket is some public priority purposes. I actually think in HIPAA, there's a, again, there, there's a list of these that I think there's quite a lot of consensus around each one of those, and there's substantive rules. Here's how we do organ donors. Here's how we do lawsuits. Here's how we do required by law, et cetera. Um, and, um, but you'll have some of those public priority uses. And then if we have decent rules around each of those to do most of the things, there's one piece that's left over that turns out to be somewhat controversial. It's called marketing. So about 97% of the yelling and screaming in the United States on privacy battles and commercial is around marketing. Should it be opt-out? Should it be opt-in? Should it be not allowed at all, such as with bank account numbers in Graham Leach Bliley? And, but if you think of, if you cleared away these other categories and then you just have marketing to focus on, there may be ways forward. You might be able to cut a political deal. You might, for instance, there's something called um, the DMA privacy promise. Direct Marketing Association has a privacy promise, which has built into it a whole set of uh, requirements for the companies that have agreed to play by those rules. And I, I, I could go through more of those in, in, in questions, or you could look at them. But if those were laws, in other words, those were substantive rules, Fred's new heroic category, substantive rules, not process. If those were substantive rules, then we wouldn't have to write a million zillion contracts, and we wouldn't have to write endless notices, because we'd have a set of basic principles that maybe organizations could understand. And so um, one of the hard issues, if you were ever to imagine a US privacy legislation, is how do you get from not incompatible to something real organizations can do in a world where we can't all go ask Katie every question because the FTC doesn't have enough people to answer all those questions and never will. And the answer may be that if we have these baskets of purposes and we define a set of common sense rules about those, and then we have an, a, an FTC website with a bunch of FAQs when the hard ones come up, that we can imagine a process where there's enough understanding of what we're in together that we might have some pretty good data processing and we don't have to call it notice or choice, we'll just call it a sensible regime. Thank you. Great. Thanks to all of our speakers. We have about half an hour for Q&A, so. Yes, Andrew? Uh, Andrew Chen, UNC Law School. Um, uh, of course, P Peter Swire is correct that uh, it's, it, we can't code uh, or we can't write code that implements the concept of incompatible uses, but we can certainly write that in natural language uh, as metadata, and there's support for that uh, in the Platform for Privacy Preferences uh, uh, Initiative uh, uh, P3P. Um, but um, I'm, I'm 
sort of w wondering about the state of play there. Um, uh, you know, the, the, I, I imagine uh, the, the, what P3P w was originally imagined to support was uh, that either you could improve annotations and, and, and thereby, uh, you know, sort of improve both the comprehensibility and, 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 uh, and, and the, the, the notice uh, functions that, that uh, Annie was talking about. Or, or even in the next generation of e-commerce, uh, where humans are, or consumers are taken out of the loop and, and have this all uh, negotiated by electronic agents. Um, so I'm, um, I, I guess this is primarily for, for Annie, but if anyone else, uh, either on the panel or in the room, uh, could, uh, has thoughts about it. Uh, I, I was sort of wondering, first of all, how widely adopted is P3P uh, now as an element of the architecture of, of e-commerce and, and, and sort of uh, what we can look for going forward on, uh, uh, from, from the perspective of, of uh, re uh, from the perspective of, of the vendors in e-commerce and then uh, and, and then sort of the prospects for consumer protection technologies that can sort of build on uh, this, this schema uh, uh, as part of the architecture. So um, P3P was a, a step in the right direction when it was first um, attempted. Um, the adoption has not been very good at all, and especially um, not good in the areas where people most care about their information. And so y you don't find banks, for instance, that have a P3P policy. You don't find healthcare institutions that have a P3P policy. But you will see the mom and pop shop that sells brownies with a P3P policy. This is a real concern. Um, P, so P3P, as I said, was a step in the right direction, but it has failed to um, live up to expectations. And part of that is that um, it's very complex. Um, another attempt was, um, uh, I can't remember the, the uh, IBM, I think it was um, EPAL. EPAL, thank you. Um, good thing my students are here. Um, and, uh, but, but again, that was from the corporate side, not from the end user side. And so. I think there are a lot of researchers who are now trying to, to, to bridge that gap. But we, what we realize is that um, companies really don't care about <coughs> making things easier for you to, to manage your privacy. And so that's why our group has shifted more focus at, okay, well, what do companies care about? Well, they care about making sure they don't break the law because we don't want to visit from the FTC, right? And so if we can develop technologies that do codify these um, purposes for which things can be used, or data can be used, and which transfers are legal, um, and then implement that in software systems and have you know, traceability so that we can prove due diligence um, when necessary, that that's really the tack we need to take. That I, I don't see P3P or a P3P-like solution anytime in the near future. We have a, a actually pretty useful um, analogy here in the way that uh, browsers and operating systems have dealt with security uh, settings. And again, it's not a very hopeful picture. So, um, you know, we now have pretty good research that shows that even though all the new versions of all the browsers, um, if, if it's a site that doesn't match its certificate, it shows up red, you get the warning, you get, and what we know is consumers ignore that universally. They click right through it, partly because they're so used to getting error messages while working that they just regard that as another error message. They click through it and they go right onto what they wanted, no matter how dangerous it is. So no matter how many cues we give them, moreover, customizable <laughs> security settings so that we you know, let them tailor, do you want this, do you want that, do you want the other, we know are universally ignored and are set lower the moment they block something somebody wants access to. So in fact, I think the research now would suggest those have been counterproductive. So rather than set a, res uh, a security level, in fact, by giving people choice, they have opted to move the whole system to a lower standard to get to that one uh, site that's gonna then infect their computer and, and shut it down. And uh, again, this suggests that uh, you know, software coded matters almost have to be factory set because the one thing we know is that people rarely change the default. And so, for example, in, in, the, in the Windows world, uh, you know, it was shipping Vista and the newest edition of uh, Explorer with a higher security setting. Rather than asking people to tailor it, even though if you're really clever, you can figure out how, it's saying the default's gonna be higher. Um, in privacy, of course, it's less easy than security because Security is, you know, we could probably get some agreement in this room about what's good and bad in security. Yeah. 
I doubt if we could in privacy. If, if I could just say one more thing. Um, another th problem with um, P3P is that you can have <coughs> two different user agents interpret the exact same P3P policy in different ways. So you're on one uh, computer one day, and it will interpret it differently because you're using a different um, browser, for instance. And then you're on another computer another day, another, another browser, and it will interpret it differently. And so that lack of consistency in actually um, checking to make sure that the policy is compliant with your preferences is a concern, and it erodes trust that you have in the technology. Just to follow up on, yeah. on P3P, I have a bit of knowledge about it. Um, one of the things that, um, well, two things. One, it's meaningless for policies other than mm -hmm. cookies. It is being utilized simply and exclusively for controlling cookies through some fortuitous <coughs> and difficult technical development. Uh, but it got that far, and that's all the further it went. Um, secondly, you can't assume that technology is in any static condition. Most, well, I can't say most. Um, you, we all would probably be surprised by the extensive use of non-HTTP cookies today. P3P is an HTTP specification. It is trivial to set a flash cookie, a local stored object, and that is what's being done now, and that way, if an advertiser is, if, if a consumer sets their settings at a reasonably high level to block HTTP cookies, the local stored object cookie, the macromedia flash cookie, will still be in place and still can be read, and the user has absolutely no clue that it's being done or how to manipulate it because it isn't subject to browser user object <coughs> technology. So the point is, it doesn't matter about how much technology you throw at this because it is only a matter of time before one, it's underutilized, or two, it's subverted. It's, technology's great, but it's ephemeral as hell. Um, yes, uh, Mike covered with the Womble Carlisle Law Firm, and first I want to thank all the panelists for your travel and your um, sexual insight. Um, I believe Professor Kate said that he's not concerned about data protection as much, and I may have taken that out of context, but to me, the elephant in the room is not what a firm tells us about its intended privacy practices, is what is that firm really doing to safeguard my data? Because most of the breaches that we read out there are not a, a violating a privacy policy intentionally, they're a violation of a company's security policy or what should have been their security policy. And I'd be interested in the panel's reaction to a system like this. Um, I'm on the North Carolina Medical Care Commission, and we're in the process now of doing a star rating system for adult care homes. And, it, and you meet a certain number of stars if you do a certain number of things. Well, I'd like to know that the holder of my data is for a certain type of data, a five-star entity, or if it's not as important, a three-star entity. And what do you think about um, an industry-led or government-led system where you claim you're a certain level of stars, and if you are, that means you're doing a certain number of things to protect data? Um, so I, I have some reactions to that. It's related to the question of can you buy insurance for your level of cybersecurity in the following way. There's been a lot of work over time where uh, the thought was, uh, if we could get insurance markets going, the private insurance companies could be the monitors to see whether this company or that company is doing a good job on insurance. What we've seen is that markets failed to take off. It's been very hard. Dick, Richard Clark, when he was in the White House, um, was pushing that very hard. Went all, to all the insurers, said the president really wants it, all this kind of stuff. Couldn't get it going. And um, the problem is that measuring it and observing it for the outside insurance company isn't any better than measuring or insuring it for the CIO. You know, somebody still walks off with a laptop. There's somebody still has a buffer overflow problem and suddenly gets out or whatever. So the measurement problem is so hard that a star rating system that you actually trust is very difficult to create. You can, you can say they'll take on certain policies. We'll encrypt end to end or we'll store encryption. You maybe can do a few things like that, but those proxies will be pr pretty imperfect 
for um, measuring overall system security. It might be worth doing, might be worth having uh, the sort of uh, safeguard stuff you have under Graham Leach Bliley to say you've studied the data flows. But those are going to be pretty basic and only cover a fairly small part of the variance, I think. Let me add a uh, relationship to your interesting uh, comment that security measures is a key element of the European uh, notice to data subjects. We are not dealing with uh, technical details or uh, on the opposite to a general promise of uh, security, but uh, a synthetic uh, and clear uh, description of the, the, the type or the level of security measure is a, a key element. And you have a, a separate right uh, when you exercise uh, your uh, right of access to obtain more and more detail uh, comments about uh, technical aspect of uh, the security measure. So I think that uh, it's an interesting point. Um, I, I would just echo uh, Peter's point, which will probably make him want to change it, but <laughs> also to go a little further to say, you know, it's a really, um, it, it's a really problematic thing because, for example, you have to say security about what for, you know, what's the use? So say it's a credit card. Well, um, I frankly don't worry a bit about credit card security because Congress has insulated me from that. Industry is going to be liable, I'm not. So I might choose to shop at the cheaper bad security site because you're going to pay for that anyway, not me. Um, I'm not sure that's a choice we want to give consumers in that environment. Um, here, you know, we used to use the model of financial regulators, although they're somewhat less in favor right now, so that might be an unwise one but sort of a combination of some standard setting and audits in advance and liability after the fact. So that rather than try to set into law or into standards, this is A security, B security, C security, to instead say this is minimal acceptable security if you're dealing with personal information that's sensitive or, or can be used for financial fraud or for other harmful uses. And if you fail to provide it, no matter how good your notice is, no matter how good your PR, no matter how fast your customer relations are, you're going to be subject to liability for it. So that we get people focused on the end result rather than on the intermediary steps. You know, how much money do I put into my PR effort when I write notices, as opposed to how good is my security? Well, and just to... And to follow on that point, I think we've certainly seen that borne out in the FTC's emphasis on data security and on consumer harm. You know, if you look at our case law, the, that's sort of the approach that we're taking here. So, you know, while we don't put out there, these are the, you know, as, as Professor Kate said, substantive steps you need to take. You know, we are expecting a certain minimum level of security, and we certainly think liability attaches if you don't meet that. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Um, I think Peter Swire made an interesting proposal uh, in his five categories. It was not only to cheer us up, uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it was a quite interesting approach. Um, and to leave all details aside, um, that approach comes very close to what the result is of the list of requirements Giovanni Buterelli was referring to. <coughs> Compatible use, local base, etc. But he was a little short at the end about how this might be implemented. <coughs> and so I'd like to invite him. W how would this work? Who would set the standard? You, you were referring to the FTC. Uh, what about <coughs> cases not covered by the jurisdiction of the FTC? What about public sector? You also included legal obligations. So make a few steps further. I, I think that's an interesting approach. But Tell us more about the implementation and how this might work. Because let me, let me just encourage you even more. I think that in the future, Europe and the US, but I speak for my own uh, field, need to be very creative in thinking about implementation <coughs> mechanisms. And things like rating systems may very well be part of it, but, but we need to, to build a bridge how this might work. So, could I tempt you to make a few steps <laughs> forward? Um, uh, I'm, I'm one person. Um, and I'm, so I think when it comes to the commercial data, which is the subject of this panel, the Federal Trade Commission has jurisdiction over much of the, of the scope. And it's, to my mind, an independent agency in all important respects. Uh, the, 
year of term of years and independent enforcement authority and significant budget and expertise. Um, and so for the, the, that set of things, the FTC seems to be uh, easy to accept into the International Data Protection Commissioner's meetings and into the sort of understanding of how this is. Um, there, there are issues about jurisdiction. The banking agencies fight like crazy not to let anybody else touch the banks. And uh, there's issues of joint oversight over medical. The FTC does have jurisdiction over medical along with health and human services. Uh, and, but I think um, there's, a, there's an entirely different long debate on the public sector. Um, that's, that's a debate I've been part of. Um, I've written about a fair bit. Um, there's currently a, a Privacy and Civil Liberties Board that was created and revised form by the Congress, um, where among other things they said everybody on the board has to be confirmed by the Senate, and President Bush has decided not to submit any names so far to the Senate, so that doesn't exist because there's nobody to staff it. So that doesn't seem to me an entirely satisfactory approach. Um, um, I had a role in the Office of Management and Budget, which was not independent, but had the important advantage of being at the place in the U.S. government where new policy proposals are considered. So anytime somebody wanted to testify in Congress, it came through OMB, and we got to, my office got to look at the draft testimony, and we got to have a uh, discussion for the Justice Department or the intelligence agencies or whatever about um, how the overall goals would be achieved. And that role on the inside, seeing things before they've been announced and seeing things in some cases that are classified, has important advantages because those proposals simply would not be distributed to people outside of the executive branch. And so uh, there may be some role for some independent subpoena, investigative, whatever entity, but much of the progress in the public sector will come from people inside of the public sector, inside of the executive branch. And I think any other approach in the United States is unlikely to see things early enough to have that kind of effect. So I offer that. Yeah. Can I have a, a, yes, a, a, yes. a brief related comment on, on, on this because I think it is, a, it is an interesting set of ideas. I think in many ways we're closer to where you want to be than, than you think um, because the, you know, the big category that you highlighted as uncertainty of you know, information that could get out is anti-fraud uses. Um, but the, the good anti-fraud products all incorporate credit header data. And you can only do that as a gramley Bliley purpose uh, of, of fighting fraud. And you can't reuse that information for anything other than the gramley Bliley purpose. So it is regulated for all practical purposes because the source data um, <coughs> is protected under gramley Bliley. And if you combine that with other data, it's still protected. Um, what's left is marketing. Uh, I think in many ways we've addressed the most intrusive part of marketing, which yeah, is telemarketing. Not call, right. uh, spam is unsolvable with current technology. <laughs> uh, and so we're left with um, you know, banner ads uh, and pop-up ads uh, where the consequences are really small uh, or the, you know, what's actually in your mailbox where throwing it away is incredibly easy. I do it all the time. A lot of the practices in the United States are not that far from, from, the, from established companies are not that far from many sectors, especially for global companies, from the practices um, that I think actually happen in Europe on a day-to-day -day level. There, there, there are some areas where that's not true. Um, but w w what in the United States, there isn't necessarily a set of understandings out in the business sectors of um, uh, how, how to scale this, how to have re all the retail companies or all the uh, other companies um, uh, be in this system. And um, in HIPAA, to bring people in, you have to write a business associate contract, and that's a very burdensome, expensive process that was required under the statute. And so it would require, I think, a statute in many instances to um, make the regularization of this actually work in the United States. Okay, uh, Jonathan Lewis, I'm a graduate student at NC State. Um, again, I guess my question is still uh, to Pierce Swire and, and sort of, uh, I guess, to the rest of the panel in general. Um, in terms of use of information, marketing uses is, is comes up a lot, and I, I want to kind of address this again. M my question would be, who would or why would anyone actually want any company collecting information about them for marketing? I mean, what good purpose would there be to let... So my question there would be simply, as a law, could it not just be, you can't do that? I mean, I don't understand why anybody would actually 
I don't. I mean, I, I know I don't. You know, all I did advertising is simply to, in some way, manipulate you to buy a product that they want you to buy. The whole concept to me is kind of what, but, but what, what would be a good use of, of marketing information? I, I can do this. I know Fred can do this. Uh, <laughs> uh, have you ever personalized a web page? Like my Yahoo or anything like that? To get like your sports teams on it or something? Or had a friend maybe who did? Actually, I don't. You don't, but you probably know some people who have. You probably know some people who, on, on book sites, uh, get suggested books based on the first 10 books they bought. And that can be pretty nice because, you know, you, you're showing up at your book club next Thursday and you have to suggest a book and you get some suggestions. Now, that might be manipulation and taking away your autonomy. And, and to some extent, it can be, depending on how the manipulation works. But another way to look at it is it could be helping um, you get some information that you want. And the, a lot of the FTC jurisprudence over the last 30 years has been seeing that advertising is information that might help consumers get to things they want. And it's not always the sort of hidden persuaders view of advertising that was sort of um, earlier voiced. I would like to, to mention the results of the greatest uh, uh, referendum on privacy, which was uh, held in my country. I'm speaking about uh, Telephone directories, the new uh, regime. 27 millions of Italians received at home a letter from uh, their uh, telecom companies in view to, um, to be invited to uh, express their consent to be mentioned uh, in the uh, written pages and on the net uh, about uh, email uh, about SMS and about uh, current mail uh, uh, messages. Uh, without any kind of uh, mm, active uh, uh, initiatives from the telecom provider, <coughs> five millions of Italians answered to this uh, letter. And more than 10% of subscribers expressed their consent to uh, every kind of uh, uh, use of their data, which are now mentioned on, on, the, on the telephone directories. It is, in my experience, uh, um, a good example, uh, because uh, I cannot imagine what would happen if uh, a telecom company would uh, uh, advertise in a very different manner and which kind of effect Obviously, you are in front of a system where you can withdraw your consent and it is a, there is an effective uh, system. So I, I give you an example uh, in which I see the possibility to balance uh, marketing purposes and uh, data subjects' interests. Maybe the only um, um, point I would add about the market, I think it's absolutely uh, fascinating. I, I think for many people, there's a huge difference between advertised or marketed and being contacted. And so you have to separate those two. So I'd be happy to take my phone number out of the phone book entirely because I don't ever want anyone to call me at home who I haven't invited to. But when I'm going to get uh, email or I'm going to visit a website, my problem isn't that it's targeted, it's that it's badly targeted. So I would frankly rather see more personal data and have a way I could correct it so that um, you know, Dell would only send me system information on systems that would be useful for me. Um, it, you know, for several years, I chaired my university's computer committee. And as a result, I get every system upgrade notice from every computer manufacturer in the country, which I don't understand and couldn't care less about. And I would like to stop them. And they would like to be stopped from that, because they're wasting money sending those to me. And part of our problem is we, we don't have a system to focus that. But when it comes time to visit eBay or Amazon or a place like that, I don't want to be shown my wife's preferences, who uses the same computer. I want to see my preferences, because they're much more interesting. <laughs> and frankly, I think most people, although they may disagree about the use of data, feel that way. You know, you don't want to get advertising for things you don't care about, whether it's uh, you know, hunting if you're a, uh, you know, you don't believe in hunting or whether it's a vegan lifestyle if you, uh, if you go out and slaughter animals every afternoon. It, it, it's the not getting the targeting right that's the problem. And if we could figure out that, I, I mean, I, I suppose industry would love to be able to target better and then allow people who want to opt out of, uh, you know, particular uses or particular types of data to do so, while at the same time allow for better targeting. Uh, it would seem like a, a gift. Can I, can I just Your invitation. To Thank you very much. <laughs> just just a, a one sentence. Uh, I, 
I mean, Fred knows these issues so well, and I agree very many times, but we sort of have, sometimes we disagree. But the, the last point about wanting heavily personalized, I think is in tension with your point four from your talk, which is the public and private are not separate. And so if there's this absolutely spectacular personalization sitting in some c commercial database, the NSA can get it, perhaps, or the FBI can get it, and increasingly they do under gag orders and national security letters. FISA is being debated in the U.S. Senate today. And so I, I, I think this is where public and private is, is we're just stuck with this problem in a post-9-11 world where you might want to have that personalization to the nth degree for the, for the ads, but you may not think that you want your local law enforcement going through it. And that's something we really haven't solved very well. I think one of the things that makes this so challenging, challenging is that privacy means different things to different people. So um, as an anecdote, just last week I went, I think it was uh, to a website, I think it was called catalog, catalogchoice.com, where you can opt out of catalogs being sent to you via the mail, snail mail. And I unsubscribed from, I think, six different catalogs. And I was so happy about this then because my mailbox will be emptier. But, you know, I kind of like my Ann Taylor catalogs and I like the emails I get with coupons, which I forward to all my girlfriends so we can all go shopping together. And so, you know, and I'm someone who likes my privacy and, and such, but, you know, everybody has differences. And so I think that's one of the things that makes this space so incredibly challenging is how do you satisfy everyone with one solution and you can't. I just wanted to add one thing about the behavioral advertising guidelines that I talked about earlier. Um, we did hear a lot at the behavioral advertising workshop that consumers do value certain types of personalized um, ads being sent to them, but you know, we're soliciting comment on whether there are categories that advertisers should just stay away from, like medical conditions, sexual orientation, information about children, that you know, maybe there should be some out of bounds areas when it comes to that kind of online advertising. One thing that people haven't talked about that much is there's been a lot of talking about how people say they want privacy, but then they don't read privacy notices. And that, I mean, I have a law degree. I have another graduate degree. I read every privacy notice, and I would still get 65% failing grade. Um, to me, when we're talking about the marketing issue, it seems like opting in rather than opting out is at least sort of a crude successful measure so that people who want the advertising can get it and people who don't, don't get it. If, I mean, I read these privacy notices and I can't understand them. And I got one once that said, check the box. I want the maximum privacy you offer. I don't want it. I, thought, I can understand that. I can send it back. Um, but most of them aren't designed that way. If I had to opt in, the companies would then have an incentive to make it clear so I could understand it. Do you want me to tell you your last 10 purchases so you'll know what books you bought? Yes, I opt in. They would have a website. You would click one thing. Um, I mean, I get these opt-out notices that say, please write to our customer service department, and they don't provide an address. You know, and the story of calling the airlines, you would have to be insane. I mean, besides for research. <laughs> Funded by the National Science Foundation. <laughs> so I mean, I, I totally agree that consent and notice does not solve a lot of problems. And I really like the five categories because it shows that there are only some that it might work. So I would argue that we have not given notice and consent a fair shake at all because the notice is incomprehensible um, and it's not really aimed at doing what people say they want to do. And then when you when you have do not call registries and everybody's trying to get on it, doesn't that tell you something about what people really want? Another thing we've noticed is a lot of policies, well, first of all, sometimes it's very difficult to find the link to the privacy policy. And another thing is if you read them carefully, they often say, um, you are encouraged to read this privacy policy. But if you should not, by visiting our website, you have implied consent and opted in. Period. So you've opted in without even realizing you have. And so, um, yeah, we have a long way to go with that. I, I think there's an enormous amount to be said on the sort of opt-in question and whether it makes things better or, or, or worse. Um, l let me say, I, I agree. I don't think we've done a very good job with notices. I don't think it will matter what we do with them. Nobody's going to read them. 
And that's what, frankly, all of our evidence is. And it's interesting, we have seen lots of studies done where people mailed the uh, institutions mailed to huge populations. You know, we're talking hundreds of thousands of people, not little test populations. The identical uh, notice, and one said, it, said if you want uh, to receive offers, you have to opt in, and the other said if you don't want to receive offers, you have to opt out. The response rates are identical. They're absolutely identical. And what that shows is what marketing research has told us for 30 years, people don't opt, period. So all of the making opt in and out and easier and clearer and all of that is fighting an uphill battle against an uncontradicted wall of research that says people just don't opt on privacy. Now, on being contacted- Except for the do not call list. It, being contacted is completely different. But remember, a do not call list doesn't say a word about privacy of your data. It says privacy of using your phone number. So whether they got your phone number because you gave it to them, whether they got your phone number because they used a random dialer, or whether they got your phone number because they calculated it from all this behavioral data that you would be a good person to call is irrelevant. The do not call list says you can't call unless there's consent. So it's a contact issue. It's privacy of the home. It's not a data protection privacy issue. And then I think there is the, uh, there's going to be inevitably a constitutional question. Right? If you know that the default is, whatever the default is, is going to uh, govern. That's going to be the rule for 98% of, of all people, or 99% of all people. And you set that default to, you may not communicate, you may not speak, you may not collect the data necessary to tailor a message. Um, I, I think that's going to make the constitutional scrutiny harder. It's not a slam dunk case. Uh, um, you know, we've, we've got cases, uh, we've got a fair number of opt-out cases now that say are constitutional, we've got a handful of opt-in cases saying not constitutional. Um, nevertheless, it's just going to take, it's in a First Amendment environment, so this is a uniquely U.S. concern, it's going to make that argument much harder. <coughs> I'm one of Dr. Anton's uh, sophomore engineering graduate students, and I have a question for uh, Professor Kate, about the first point that you made in conclusion. Um, you said that transparency is much more important than notice, and I kind of like that, that sentiment because notice is sort of like a firewall at the edge of your network, and transparency is kind of like something that could cover the entire thing. You know, if something goes wrong anywhere in the network, you might be able to see it. But it kind of goes to Peter Swire's point about secondary uses because here I am as a software engineer and I don't have any ability to design a transparent system, you know, like transparent about what? Transparent to whom? So I'm curious what you would say to a software engineer trying to implement something like that. Well, to be perfectly honest, I don't think this is a software problem. I think it's a law problem. And so what you have to do, I mean, that's the only way, frankly, we get transparency in this country. We don't get it through software. We get it through regulatory requirements. And uh, it's, not, it's not software developer's fault. It's because that's the way industry and government agencies are going to use software. The natural tendency is not to uh, um, use it in a, in a transparent way. Nobody wants public criticism. Nobody wants public input. We would all much rather do things uh, uh, quietly unless we want publicity for them. And so I think transparency really means uh, making the information available in a, in a centralized way. So for example, in Indiana, we now have a bill pending in the state legislature to say, fine about reporting all these security breach notices to all these individuals who don't know what to do with them, but you must also report it to the attorney general who shall within 24 hours post it on a website. But, the web, but available when? when the, the collection is already well, well we're talking there about breaches i would want transparency at the very beginning in other words i would go back to a that's privacy key, act notice of point. transparency which says when you roll out the system you have to have with it um, the type of disclosure that makes clear uh, how the data are going to be collected how they're going to be used are they going to be stored according to you know uh, stamp frankly i would take that off the table because i'd make that a legal requirement um, secondary use, you would cover there. In other words, they can commit. Many companies today commit. We will not use these data for other purposes. Of course, they're still subject to subpoenas and legal obligations and so forth. One problem in the notice world we're in now, and it's sort of inevitable, I don't in any way mean this as a, as a criticism here of the FTC, but knowing that the FTC is going to use your notice as a promise that they are then going to come in force against you has done a lot to add to the length and complexity of notices. Transparency, you could be in an environment that might help avoid some of that. So you wouldn't be making, I mean, think about our notice situation today. It's treated as the basis of a 
promise, even though we know the person who you're protecting has not read the promise or relied on the promise. And that's just a silly, I mean, to lawyers, that's a very difficult concept. I think transparency moves you far beyond that. And frankly, is uh, of the many things laudable about the European system, I think transparency is one of the most important. And our last question. Oh, actually, this is to bring it back to the European side. And uh, because some of the comments that uh, Mr. Buttarelli was making had to do with the substantive requirements of the European scheme, which to some extent uh, uh, compensate for some of the problems with the procedural notice and choice uh, scheme. And I was wondering, when it comes to some of these substantive requirements, like proportionality, they're a little bit like prohibitions on secondary use. But what <coughs> is proportionality? And these are very wide sweeping, far sweeping um, requirements. Basically, you can't use data in such a way to further your business purposes if it disproportionately burdens the <coughs> privacy rights of the individual. Now, what does that mean for a business? And how is it that uh, it, it, the Italian authority and other European authorities effectively give guidance to firms in trying to figure out <coughs> what is proportional and what's not? Uh, first of all, I would like to say that the, the, the Italian, the European system is not uh, related to just one purpose, to just one uh, finality. We, uh, when we speak about the secondary use, we, we should be clear because we, uh, the principle is the principle of compatibility. So there are some additional purposes which might be uh, followed. Uh, and I think that uh, you might uh, be in front of the same problem for every kind of civil uh, litigation when you are uh, discussing uh, about uh, the, the implementation of uh, implementation of, uh, of a contract. Uh, our national experience is so clear because we uh, we, we work uh, daily about the uh, traditional contractual or pre-contractual uh, relationship. And so we uh, try to find uh, everything is uh, necessarily related to the contractual uh, framework. And we try to distinguish what, uh, how, how much the uh, data subject uh, can uh, benefit uh, of this contractual uh, framework <laughs> without being obliged to be used for uh, other uh, uh, purposes which are just in the data controller uh, interest. Um, and um, I think that our uh, approach is a sort of a judicial approach because our system is, uh, gives to the authority the power to examine uh, claim, complaints and so on. Uh, our decision <coughs> might be appealed uh, to a court and let me proudly tell you that uh, more than 99% of our decisions have been uh, confirmed by, by the courts. Coming back to the uh, transparency and, and notice, uh, I had no uh, sufficient time during the trip <laughs> <laughs> to uh, describe our uh, experience uh, uh, about the use of concise uh, notices, uh, how much we promote a sort of a jargon-free uh, language, how much we focus on essential items of information to be uh, provided. So uh, we daily encourage uh, short and easily understandable uh, informations which are also be useful for implementing the purpose limitation principle. And I would like to give you an example. Professor Rodotà would uh, uh, certainly remember a procedure where we um, were obliged to decide uh, to punish or to apply a sanction to the region of Tuscany about uh, uh, a coupon published on many newspapers. Uh, the notice was so short and uh, formally speaking uh, not in line with the law. But we renounced to apply this uh, sanction, uh, applying the principle of uh, substantial uh, the effectiveness of uh, the, the notice. The notice was uh, the region of Tuscany, which means implicitly not others, will use this data just for uh, send you at home a leaflet, which 
means, in our perspective, no other uses, no uh, communication of data to uh, third uh, parties, uh, uh, destruction of data after this kind of use. So, uh, we uh, courageously <laughs> decided <laughs> to uh, not to apply this sanction. So I think that our experience is not so formal, and I really appreciate comments which uh, uh, go into the direction of being uh, uh, effective to in this direction. Okay. And we are out of time. The lunch is immediately following. It's across the street. You'll want to go out the front doors here and left past our construction site to the building across the street. And, and everybody's invited, please join us. Thank you so much. Thank you.